BASF is the oldest, largest, and most distinguished institution in the United States that is focused on the study of natural resources and the environment. It's very rare to have a community of faculty, staff, and students that have such a strong common purpose. Shortly after the college was formed, there were some very cogent statements issued by the dean that said, we need to consider forestry in the broadest sense. Back in the history of the folks, was some real leadership that always took the basis of this wonderful forest resource and then moved it to its margin in terms of what are the next developments, what are the next fields emerging. Our centennial year offers a special opportunity to look at the past, the present, and the future of the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. I'm Betsy Elkins, and I'd like to share our story with you. We celebrate our first 100 years in the midst of the biggest transformation in the college's history with the opening of our first residence hall and construction of the Gateway Building underway. Before there was an ESF, before there was a College of Forestry at Syracuse University, there was a College of Forestry at Cornell. Professional forestry education in this country really started in the mid to late 1800s. And by the 1870s, Cornell was offering some forestry courses. Bernard Furneaux was hired to be the dean of the forestry college in, in, at Cornell. Furneaux worked closely with the forest industry in the Adirondacks. But at that time, the forest industry was, didn't manage their forests. It was sort of a rape and pillage kind of forest management. Not for Noah's fault, but the industry's fault. But he got painted with that picture. And so the state decided to close the forestry school at Cornell. Just so happened, a person very involved in the protection of the Adirondacks, a fellow by the name of Lewis Marshall, was on the board of trustees of Syracuse University. If it hadn't been for Lewis Marshall, we wouldn't be here because the Cornell political lobby was, and to their credit, and I have some good friends at Cornell, was, was and is very strong. And, and they wanted to start the college back up at Cornell. But Lewis Marshall, uh, who, as I said, was a prominent Syracuse lawyer and a, a good friend of the governor at that time and knew a lot of state legislators, convinced the governor to sign into law this legislation here. But instead of it being given to Syracuse University, it had its own board of trustees, and so there was always that state control. The chancellor or his representative did, and still, of Syracuse University, still sits as an ex-officio member of the college's board of trustees. The legislation creating the New York State College of Forestry at Syracuse University was signed into law on July 28, 1911. It was a humble beginning. The college consisted of one room and two teachers in Lyman Hall on the SU campus where ESF and SU colleagues returned for a centennial convocation to kick off our 2011 celebration. Bray Hall opened in 1917, facing west instead of north, like the buildings at SU, because Dean Hugh Baker envisioned the quad we now have. Legend has it that Dean Baker and some co-conspirators relayed the boundary stakes the night before the groundbreaking. The college grew slowly and developed a close-knit community as illustrated by the annual barbecue. This one held in 1940 at Green Lake State Park. Apparently, plaid was practically a school uniform, and the lumberjack games have always been part of the college. Another tradition that continues today is the combined graduation with SU. Today, it's staged in the Carrier Dome, but in earlier years, like 1951, it was in the same location, but then it was Archibald Stadium. Commencement festivities included a reception in Bray Hall Rotunda with Dean Joseph Illick. Dr. Ross Whaley, during a conversation at ESF's restored Huntington Lodge in the heart of the Adirondacks, traced the college's academic evolution. Here you had the roots in forest management. 
But then as you start looking at the forest enterprise, it goes from not only to the management of the land, but the products that are developed. So emerging then becomes a pulp and paper program. Well, pulp and paper, if you think about it, is actually a highly specialized subset of chemical engineering. So, so wouldn't it make sense, as it matured, that chemistry, and chemistry that focused on a polymer, which wood is, would then take on a, a, a standing of its own and a new department. And if you say, think the same thing about other forest services and products, recreation, the institution starts getting in recreational planning. And from that comes design. And from that leads into landscape architecture and a more urban aspect of it. And if you think of forest as a habitat for wildlife, which then leads into biology. So as I look back on this, it seems to me that there's a, a logical evolution. And the only thing that's surprising to me is why didn't other institutions do it also? Back in the history of the place was some real leadership that always took the basis of this wonderful forest resource and then moved it to its margin in terms of what are the next developments, what are the next fields emerging. One of those people was Edward Palmer, the first non-forester to lead the college and the first to lead under the title of president instead of dean. At that time, the world had changed. Words conservation and forest management were being replaced with terms like environmental management and preserving the environment. Now, the college had been doing that sort of stuff for decades. The college was doing a lot of environmental teaching and research, but it was not being recognized for it. President Palmer decided that we should change the name of the college and that we should have an environmental academy here, an environmental institute. Well, his grand plans were met with a lot of reluctance by the faculty who felt that the only thing we needed to do was explain forestry better to the public. Controversy went on. The legislature wasn't sure what to do. But finally, the name of the college was changed to State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, where we are today. When I started here a long time ago, there was forest botany, forest zoology, forest entomology. And over the years, we've grown a lot more interdisciplinary, recognizing that those boundaries need to dissolve so that we can create new majors, new programs that are at heart interdisciplinary. When I first was on campus, there was basically no research being done in landscape architecture. Um, and now there's considerable uh, research being done, um, both locally and at the national and international level. I think this, the idea of using Syracuse and the environs as a living environment, and actually doing projects in the community. Experiential learning is one of the things that makes this college truly, truly unique. Not that other places don't do experiential learning, but experiential learning is everywhere, not just in a few places. In 1978 or 9, uh, my urban design studio had did a study of Armory Square, uh, then looking at how could investment be generated and the use of the federal income tax credits uh, was one of the things that we investigated and surely that is um, what has helped turn that place around. really reflects our thinking that nature is the best teacher and our students reinforce that. They tell us that five weeks at, at Cranberry Lake they learn more then than they do in an entire semester in the classroom. I think probably the best answer to why is because it's always been. This institution began as a forestry school. Uh, you cannot do forestry without being out in the woods. Provost Bongarten is speaking literally. Just a year after the creation of the College of Forestry, the Rich Lumber Company donated 1,200 acres of former forest land in Wanakina to educate professional foresters.
So in 1912, the Ranger School began. Um, the original students actually came here and uh, built the road into here and uh, built the buildings to, where they had their classes. Uh, and uh, the first class graduated in 1913. And so to establish this place in the, in the beginning, the students had to come out and restore the woods. They had to create, build the roads, you know, turn tra railroad tra tracks into roads or into trails. They had to plant trees, you know, massive planting efforts through the first several decades or first few decades of the school's history. We have 2,800 acres here where our students are able to, and they do, they work on just about the whole forest throughout the year. Um, right, right now we're looking out uh, back actually towards where the main building is. So. Um, beautiful view from up here, and then you're looking over into uh, the Five Ponds Wilderness area of the Adirondack Park. One of the things that happens at the field stations is building teamwork and creating a real sense of community. When you're cut off from the technology that quite honestly tends to separate us from land and separate us from each other, suddenly the students really have to draw upon their ability to create community, to work cooperatively, to solve problems. That holism means that you're going to be learning from the student who just took ornithology. They're able to tell you what it is that you're hearing. You're learning from the student who took entomology. So that collaborative learning um, happens in the field in a, in a really powerful way. Awesome. Field experience isn't confined to the Adirondacks or the St. Lawrence River, nor is it confined to forestry, science, and engineering. It's been a part of landscape architecture since the early 1970s. These are students from the State University of New York College of Forestry, students in the School of Landscape Architecture. Immersed in a vastly different physical and social environment, 2,500 miles from their home campus. This afternoon we're going to start the physical inventory and analysis of Antigua. While much research is done in campus laboratories, faculty and students are also working on projects on all seven continents, as close to home as the Lafayette Field Station to as far away as Antarctica. Dave Kieber works in all parts of the globe on the sulfur cycle in the oceans. He works in Antarctica. He works in Bermuda. Lucky guy. We had very prominent researchers here uh, in the early 1900s. The person that preceded me in the course that I teach now was teaching here in 1938. was extremely well known worldwide. Some centers such as the Cellulose Institute were started right after the Second World War. Uh, these were people that are known internationally. My, my, like Michael Schwartz, um, Israel Cabasso has dozens of patents. The college always had a tremendous research presence. The number of sponsors that we have has increased tremendously. We're currently over 400 different projects with at least 30 different sponsors, if not more. From 1972, the increase has gone from a few hundred thousand dollars to 14 and a half million dollars in research. I remember asking a question two years ago. Where in the world is ESF? We have 57 research projects outside of the U.S., a research project on every continent. We have partnerships, some 40 different partnerships with educational institutions scattered throughout the globe. Clearly, ESF is a global player. One of our faculty members, James Gibbs, is the leading researcher for um, the restoration of, of tortoises on, in, the, in the Galapagos Islands. <laughs> Jackie Frere in, in uh, EFB is looking at uh, coyotes and wolves and what is their proper place in today's environment that is heavily populated uh, with people. We've invented a number of varieties of willow. The willow will grow 18 feet in, in three years and be cut, harvested, turned into biofuel, bioplastics. Uh, we, were, we are leaders in that area. Dr. Ed White, who had my position before I did, really developed this field along with Larry Abrahamson, Larry Smart. In the forest biorefinery, we take wood chips, mix them with water, put them under pressure at a fairly high temperature, and that extracts about a quarter of its mass. Uh, in what we extract are sugars and other useful chemicals. The sugars we will convert to ethanol, 
butanol or biodegradable plastic. The other chemicals will go for sale. The wood chips now, which are only three quarters of their original weight, are actually improved for use in pulp and paper or for making pellets or for making reconstituted wood products. With the extraordinary issues that our faculty are studying today in the area of environmental issues and natural resources, we have a body of information that is most important for us as an institution to get out to the public and to policymakers so appropriate decisions can be made. The college is now recognized locally and at the state level uh, as the research and teaching institution that it is. When I first got here, there was a joke that always came up saying we're more well known in Burma than we are in Syracuse. I think uh, certainly the administration has worked very, very hard uh, to get us in the news and on TV. Uh, that, I think, is a major, major change. Rain gardens and porous paving are now part of the campus infrastructure. Composting and biodiesel production from food waste are part of the daily routine, initiatives that were driven by students. ESF is a very unique place because of the quality of the students that we have the pleasure to teach and the students that we have the pleasure to work with. They are committed, passionate young people. Literally, they drive this as an educational institution. I think the sense of community makes it really special. All the students are like-minded, which is really great. You go around, you see everyone carrying a mug, you know, everyone's trying to be as green as possible. And I don't think you see that on a lot of campuses. I think we attract a um, really a special breed of students and faculty and staff. You know, by, by the mission of the college, we tend to attract people that are committed to something other than themselves. You know, not only are they awesome students, but then they participate in all this community work. They participate in clubs. They participate on student government. Um, it, it just seems like they, uh, when we do scholarship applications for some of the scholarships that the Alumni Association gives away, I mean, you read their credentials. I, I mean, they're just so involved. Um, they're much more all-around people, it seems, um, than, than the typical student would be. Our students really believe that with the, in the area of study and with the background that they're developing here at the college, that they can make a, a big difference in this world. That they can literally have the ability to change the perception about environmental issues and to make this world be a better place. I definitely think in the past um, students were focused on maybe using the environment more wisely, whereas now we're trying to preserve it as it is rather than reap some sort of like economic benefit from it. And I think there are a lot more environmental issues to be aware of these days. So yeah, I think uh, we're getting more aware and it's a very good thing and I think the students in the future will be more aware than we are. We've got a great faculty here at ESF. And I, I've spoken to them numbers of times about how they could make more money teaching at another institution. But what really keeps them here at ESF is the inc incredible cohort of students that they have the privilege to teach. Students come with commitment, dedication, and that means they're also really going to work hard and, and push their faculty to uh, challenge them. Well, I think a lot of professors here are one of the best, if not the best, in their field. But what I really like and my favorite professors is that they know they know a lot about what they're doing but they're still really humble about it and they make themselves approachable for us and they make time for you and um, they help you with your research too getting research and if something doesn't go right they help you fix your problems so definitely that they're approachable and they're there for you. While a college's century mark is a logical time to pause a moment and take stock it is also a time to turn and look forward. There are some extraordinary challenges today relative to the health of our forests, relative to the protection of water supply systems, relative to climate change of an extraordinary nature, global nature, critical threats to well-being of societies we understand in this globe. ESF is very, very well positioned to make a substantial difference in trying to come up with resolutions and solutions to these threats. The future of ESF is really, at this point in time, is really interesting because if one looks, if one thinks of it simply as a forestry school, turning out people who deal with the production of forest products in the traditional sense, and then look at what's happening to forest industry in this country, you can say that the future isn't terribly bright. There's been a, 
There's been a decline in the size of the pulp and paper industry. There's been a decline in the size of the uh, lumber industry in this country. So one could say, wow, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not a purpose for ESF anymore. On the other hand, if you look at forests, not as a way of producing pulp and paper or lumber, but as a phenomenal chemical feedstock that's renewable, then I think what you're going to find is the future means that at some point, because of shortage of petroleum, plastics as we know it become so expensive that you can't use them. Uh, petroleum as we know it becomes so expensive you can't use it. And here's a renewable chemical feedstock that will solve these problems, at the same time maintain an ecological integrity for a, a place that sequesters carbon, a place that we can go recreate, a place that's habitat to wildlife. So, will ESF look the same 15 years from now as it does today? Probably not. Will it be prosperous, healthy, and important? Absolutely. ESF is always on the cutting edge. We're always looking for the needs of society and the programs that are, are most relevant in terms of instruction, but also in the area of research. Some of those, for example, are in the issue of environmental health. We're working very closely with Upstate Medical University because we have found that many chronic diseases have a strong linkage to vectors from the environmental sector. Equally in the area of renewable energy, we're mounting a program in renewable energy management in order that we can help society move in the direction to get off a fossil fuel based energy system to a renewable energy based system. We're constantly looking at those opportunities that we can help, that we can exploit, that we can add value. This is a very, very critical time, very critical junction in this world. And we all know that there are some very strong challenges in this century. We at ESF, we're confident that we can meet those challenges, we can add value, and our students will be leaders in this area. But for a moment, let's stop and celebrate like these folks at Cranberry Lake in the 1930s. Bring out the birthday cake and light up the candles. It's been an amazing 100 years and an exciting harbinger of what's to come. I'm Betsy Elkins. Thanks so much for watching. But sure is fun to be alive these days There's no reason ever to be bored We got iPods and MP3s We got iPhones and Blackberries We got video games so true to life And high-def TVs hooked to satellites Well, where does all this stuff come from? Is it A, Walmart, B, Target, or C? None of the above of this stuff that we love Comes from the land The food that we eat comes from Animals and plants Yeah, the homes where we live Are built from stone and wood Mother Earth provides it all Don't you think we should? Thank the Earth Respect the Earth Protect the Earth Thank the Earth This is my movie. <laughs> and suddenly... ...it's time to pause and take stock. It's also time to look forward and pivot and see what's coming up in the future. Good, we'll go with that one. ...to law on July 11, 1911. Whoops, wrong date. <laughs> Can I do a little bit broader thing than that? Sure. Okay. You're the president. You can do anything you want. You're, you're orchestrating. <laughs> and I have to follow your request.